us this morning. So one of the things that evangelicals, but when not, I was, you know, I say that, that's just because that's the only world that I've known. But really, it's not limited to evangelicals. It's part of probably other Christian denominations, but it's also a reality of other organizations. Is almost this, this idea that information will bring transformation. And uh, I do believe information contributes to the process of transformation. But what we do with the information is way more important than amassing the information in our brains or in our notebooks. And, and so, but because there's this pressure to get it right, to get the doctrine right, and um, I have never been a part of any group that used the word heretic quite like uh, Southern Oklahoma Bible Belt Evangelical Churches. They like to use that word, and a heretic is someone whose doctrine is wrong. But really, historically, a heretic was not only do they have wrong doctrine, but we believe because of that they should be excommunicated from the church, and we also believe that their soul will be consigned to hell whenever they pass from this life. So that word heretic has a really heavy history, and yet we throw it around quite a bit. Um, I've donned it myself a few times over the past few years, uh, I've come to find out. Um, and, and so w with this idea, there's this, there's this idea that we have to get everything right, have all the information right, have all the doctrinal statement just right. And I think that that's a mistake because I don't think that's in keeping with reality. And I also don't think that it's, it's in keeping with the testimony of the humanity of the people in the scripture. The scripture does not present a group of people who has it all figured, who have it all figured out and they just go forth in perfected thinking for the rest of their life. It's ebbing and flowing and they're making mistakes and they're growing. And I think all of this is to set up a topic that I really went back and forth for weeks over. And I will tell you, at the end of the day, I landed on, we're not gonna do that. That's really what my preference was. But unfortunately, I couldn't shake the fact that I think we really need to talk about it. And it works attaching it to our prayer series. We can make it part nine. Um, and so we're gonna talk about it this morning. But I want to confess to you, I am not an expert on this topic. I will not pretend to be. In fact, I will say that there's, I have a lot of confusion about this topic from time to time. And so all I'm going to do is share from the vantage point of what I feel assured about, assured about from the scriptures. Um, and, and, and the caveat I want to give is my hesitancy is when you talk about the topic of spiritual warfare, it seems that the church either makes the mistake of dismissing it altogether, particularly now, because now we tend to trust the uh, social sciences, sciences and psychology and, um, and, and therapeutic approaches for the explanation of evil way more than we like to explore uh, mysterious sources of evil. We're way more comfortable with this. And I want to be clear, I believe in the insights of these disciplines, of the social sciences and psychology and therapy. I believe in all of those things. But I don't think that I have so much confidence in them that I'm comfortable dismissing what the Bible says about some of the potential sources of evil in the world and resistance in the world. So really what I want to talk about, we use words like spiritual war warfare, but what I just want to talk about is in a larger generic category called resistance. Because whether you were a charismatic that saw demons behind every arcade game, or you were a, a Christian, I don't know other denominations that, don't, that didn't talk, we talked about it a lot. We talked about demons almost more than Jesus, personally. But but you may be part of a group that was like, oh, that's myth, that's silly, and you dismissed it altogether. I think both of those are mistakes, to pretending like Satan's not real, to having a projection of Satan and the demonic that makes them way more mythologically powerful than what they are in the scripture. Uh, I think that those are the two mistakes. So I'm gonna create some space for us to talk about, but I wanna be vulnerable and honest with you, and I don't wanna say that I pretend like I know all the answers, and I think that I've seen a lot of unhealthy abuse I think it's very abusive if you have a hormonal imbalance or a chemical imbalance or you're suffering from clinical depression and the only thing that your church is telling you is that you've got to pray through it because it's demonic. I think that is an enormous mistake. Now, I also think 
if I were to say all my problems can be solved by medication or psychological and sociological enlightenment, I also think that would be a mistake because I'm not factoring in the fact that there is, an, uh, there is a, an enemy that I don't fully see and understand, but there's resistance. That resistance is talked about in the Bible. And we have to talk about that resistance. And, and, and we have to be honest and say that resistance can have multiple forces. But what I'm telling, what I'm suggesting to you is that we all need to be mindful of resistance in our lives. Whether that's from hormonal imbalances or to maybe a potentially malevolent resistance that we're feeling that has, is supernatural in its origins. Resistance is something you're going to experience. Some of you experienced it this morning when that alarm went off. Immediately, there was resistance to the idea of getting up, getting dressed, having your coffee, and coming here to gather in person with other believers to worship the Lord. Um, uh, and so, so you might have felt that. Some of you may have a ministry on your heart or maybe a book that you need to write or, 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 a, or a, a podcast you need to start or a, 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 a web class that God's calling you to do, but there's resistance. We might call it procrastination. We might call it ir uh, ignorance or whatever, but there's resistance to that dream that's in your heart. You need to be aware of the reality of what God may be calling you to do that you're abandoning because you haven't thought about maybe the resistance is something that I'm called to resist not simply acquiesce. So in reality, resistance is a way of yielding to the leading of the Spirit. But the idea this morning is that some way, the way we yield to the Spirit is by learning how to resist the enemy or resist the, in the resistance in however it's coming to us. So, so in that regard, there is a place. I mean, I, I've tried to make the case that although I believe in social sciences and medical sciences, that even things like the prayer of meditation and the prayer of examine that we talked about this week, I believe these practices can actually contribute not just to you being more spiritual, but actually can heal your, some of your mental health issues. Not all of them, but I think that they can help. Some mental health uh, symptoms that we have, particularly in the realm of depression or in the realm of we've got major blind spots that are hindering our relationships, there's nothing better than the prayer of examine to sit down before the Lord and allow the Lord to begin to heal heal you and to grow you and to make you a more e effective person in the realm of your relationships. Um, so, so, so I believe in those, but I think that there's also a place that we see in scripture and that we experience in reality where there's a place where we, we, we're not just asking and meditating and thinking. We are taking the authority that we have in Christ and we're executing it here on earth. And the idea of resistance is at the very center of the Lord's Prayer, and that's why I think it's important that we, don't resist, that we don't abandon it. Because in the Lord's Prayer, this is the prayer that Jesus gives after his disciples say, teach us to pray. Well, that prayer is really kind of, there's a lot of war metaphor in that prayer. Uh, the idea of God's kingdom coming. That's the imagery of a superior kingdom coming and becoming the authority where a former kingdom used to be the authority. That's kind of aggressive. But then there is that prayer is that it was, it was your kingdom come, your will be done. And I think we talked a little bit about that in the original Greek. The tenses of those verbs would be more accurately translated kingdom of God come, will of God be done. These are declarations in their original structure. They're not requests. And then, of course, it ends up with the prayer, lead us not into temptation, but what? What's the contrast? Deliver us from, deliver us from evil. So there is a reality of enemies that resist us in our spiritual path. And we need to be balanced in our approach, but we also don't need to be foolish and pretend like it's not real. My friends, we are Christ's body on earth. We are responsible to push back the darkness as we shine the light. We are Christ's body. We're responsible to shine the light and push back the darkness. So our big idea this morning is simply that we call forth and declare the kingdom come and the will of God to be done as we engage in authoritative prayer. Authoritative prayer. So... Um, this prayer that I'm talking about is not so much talking to God as much as it is speaking for God. This is, this is not where we are necessarily asking God to do something, which is 90 to 95% of prayer. So I don't want to take away from that. But for this morning, what we're talking about, we're not talking about asking God to do something. We are commanding something to be done in the name and the authority of Jesus. We are commanding something to be done 
in the name and the authority of Jesus. And if you'll recall, we certainly see this modeled in Jesus, but we also see it modeled in his disciples. And we see it continue to be modeled on into the actions of the church in the book of Acts that we spent a few years uh, uh, looking at and taking in. So for me, I don't want to deny resistance, but I am 100% opposed to the kind of theology that is dualistic in thinking. Now, my guess is most Christians would not take a theology test and affirm dualistic thinking. But in their practice, they affirm it all the time. And dualism says this, there's good and evil in the world, and they're equal, and they're battling this thing out. I do not believe that that is the cosmology of the Bible. The Bible does not teach there is this powerful God and this powerful Satan, and they're duking it out on the stage of humanity. But many people live as if that's true. So I think that for spiritual warfare or resistance warfare or authoritative prayer to be effective, we have to understand the real nature of the, quote, battle. Which, number one, is this. The battle that we feel is based on lies and deception, not on power. It is based on lies and deception, not on power. So if we really want to look to deep theology, we just have to take a moment to think about um, the movie A Bug's Life, right? Remember A Bug's Life? I mean, you guys remember that? Okay. I See, I'm trying to get pop references that are more than just five years old. Um, but Bug's Life, wonderful film. Wonderful film. Um, but there's that scene where the intimidating grasshopper is talking to the other grasshoppers because they have all this false arrogance because they think they answer nothing, right? We were just, uh, they can't provide any resistance. And what the leader of the bully grasshoppers, his revelation is, you idiots, if they ever figure out that they outnumber us 100 to 1, we're toast. I, I improvised a little bit in there. Uh, and so it's this idea, the idea that the grasshoppers oppress the ants solely on the basis of lies and intimidation, not on the substance of being actually able to overpower them. Now, if you were Pentecostal, you should have said amen to that because that is one of the key insights that you have to understand about spiritual warfare. It's not about us literally putting on our armor and slicing up demons. It, it is about rooting out and identifying the lies and deception which take the form of toxic beliefs that we hold in our heart. So when I say that racism is demonic, I don't necessarily mean that there is a demon and his name is racism, but that when he was born or however that works, his mom and dad didn't say, what should we name him? Oh, let's name him racism. And then he'll sit on your shoulder and make you a racist if you're human. But that's kind of the presentation that we get. But what I am saying is, Racism is a toxic belief system that is a lie and a deception that gets rooted into our hearts until we actually believe it's truth. And then even when we deny that it's truth, if we don't root it out, it still continues to dominate and control our behavior. This is the kind of spiritual warfare that I'm talking about. So it's really important that we understand when we talk about spiritual warfare, it's not like we're in danger of demons getting us, okay? This isn't insidious. This isn't the conjuring. That's not what I'm talking about here. So let's begin with, I think, one of the more important scriptures about spiritual warfare that's in Ephesians 1. In fact, it's so important that I have it in here twice. I want to read through it in the Christian Standard Version of the Bible so that you can get, uh, uh, maybe that's the language that speaks to you, but I also want to read from it in the New Living Translation because it might have language that speaks to you and brings a little more clarity. But what I want to do is I want you to see these two verses. But the most important one is Ephesians 1. Verses 20 through 23. He exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. Far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Verse 21 is a really important verse for your theology of spiritual warfare. You need to begin by understanding that spiritual warfare is about enforcing a victory, not having to attain one. That's already been done. That's what Jesus, he's the one that gets the credit for that. In fact, 
that's a good idea. Let's just read it again, verse 21. Far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything. Everyone say subjected everything. Like, I, I, this is just a phase. I'm going to stop that soon, I promise. Uh, and he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Skip the next verse. Let's read that same verse again in the New Living Translation, shall we? That raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ. Oh my goodness. Put that in your theological pipe and smoke it this week. Just that one phrase. Do you believe this? God has put all things under the authority of Christ. One more time for those in the back. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. So we begin with, with spiritual warfare kind of discussion with the revelation that we should be optimistic in our approach because Jesus has won. Jesus rules. There is no place where we have to take God because God is everywhere. Now, there are places where darkness has illegitimately squatted and pretended as though they have authority over that sphere, whether it's a home or it's a geographical location or it's an industry like human trafficking. So we do recognize that although Christ rules, his body is still called to make his kingdom tangible, particularly in those places where the kingdom of darkness is making their presence tangible illegitimately. It is always, always, always illegitimate. We who follow Jesus and we operate off of his agenda will prevail. We win. And so we begin with this idea that all spiritual warfare is an enforcing of the victory of Christ. Now with that, here's what I want you to see. I love Ephesians, and I love those places in Ephesians, and you have those places, uh, some in Philippians 2, and you have those sections in Colossians, but I love it because of the way they express this powerful vision of the living Christ, and this is, this is one of them that does that. It, it, it's, it, it kind of takes your breath away as you think about that magnificence of the God-man that Jesus has, that God has chosen to put all things on, to whom God has given all authority. It's magnificent, this idea. It's Jesus. He fills all things everywhere. There is not a place where he is not. And there is not a place geographically or in the souls of mankind where he doesn't have to write to say, this belongs to me. That's, that's the God we are contemplating and worshiping. Uh, and, so, and so we begin with the victory of Christ. But here's what is truly amazing. And this is the part I fear too many of us just won't get this morning. I feel the burden of the limitations of my own ability to communicate here when we talk about these things because I think we're talking about some of the most important things of the universe and I am not, I feel intimidated to speak of such mysteries. But here's what's amazing. You take that declaration of who Christ is and the power of his authority over the earth and you read along and you remember that the book of Ephesians was not writtenly, originally written with breaks. He didn't say, okay, this is chapter one, so here's what I'm going to talk about. Now we're changing themes, so now we're going to start chapter two. And how, that is not how these were written. These were cohesive letters that were meant to be written, read in one sitting. So they all flow together. This model of preaching, where we take just a little bit and talk about it, although I participate in that, I struggle a little bit because I don't believe that's how the scriptures were originally written, 
to be studied and read. They were supposed to be taken as a totality. So with that in mind, what I want you to see is if we, if we put together Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, and then we put right next to it Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, which isn't that much farther, I think that you're going to discover something that I find staggering. Because in Ephesians 1, 20, we'll go back to the Christian Standard Version, it says in verse 20, he exercised his power in Christ by raising him from the dead, seating him at his right hand in the heavens. 2, 6, he also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. Now, do you see what Paul just did? He said, let me make it clear the identity of your Lord. And then in 2.6, he said, let me make it clear your identity. Your, the truest thing about you is that you are seated with Christ. All that is true of Jesus is in some mysterious way true about you as well. Your core identity as a human being is rooted in the revelation of Jesus' identity as a sovereign, loving Savior because we are seated there with him. I know it messes with people, and I understand that it might be like, hmm, what are you saying theologically? I'm not sure I like that. I get it. That's fine. Coffee, Reuben, let's talk. But from now on, when people say, when we were saved, well, for one thing, for me, it's pretty confusing because I got saved about seven times. And uh, so I was, I'm well insured. Uh, I'm going to be at the head of the line. I'm certain of it. But the truth of the matter is, and I don't say this with a wink, wink. This has staggered me and altered me. I was saved approximately 80 AD 33 because I was saved when my Lord conquered death once and for all and ascended to his place of authority in the heavens. That's the day Artie Favre was saved. That's the day Artie Favre's sins were forgiven and washed away 100%. My eternal destiny was sealed, A.D. 33, give or take. Because that's who we are. So now we are Christ's body on earth. So you see why this church thing, it's not just an additive to our own journey of self-improvement. You can do it that way. You can do it that way for 20, 30 years, but you're gonna be bored and there's a lot you're gonna miss. What you're being called to is to live out and a new identity that is called the new creation. The old has passed away and all things have become new. Why? Because the new humanity has been seated with Christ, not underneath the foot of the enemy, but above all authority and rulers and powers and principalities. That's where you live, baby. That's it. So we'll go to the to live, living too. It says that, Verse 20, the new living. He raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Verse 2, 6, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So Paul is retaining this language to say the identity of Jesus is the identity of his body on earth. In fact, this idea is so central to our New Testament faith that it, 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 I, it burns within me to get out so that people could understand it. Our goal is not to live as good Christians. Our goal is to live in Christ. In fact, the word Christian appears three times in the New Testament. Three, one, two, three, you can count them. And then it wasn't even, orig it didn't originate by the followers of Jesus. It was a nickname that the pagans or the unbelievers gave to the group that followed the way of Jesus. They're the ones that came up with the word Christian. However, the phrase in Christ is used 164 times in the New Testament. This is not about you being a Christian. It is about you learning to live from the revelation that you, my friend, are in Christ. That's what we're after. That's the goal. I don't want better Christians. I want people living more deeply from the revelation is that I am in Christ. That is the hope for our world. That's the way we are going to heal the world is by letting ourselves be healed to live by that identity of in Christ. 
Our faith is not so much an organized religion as it is a revelation of identity. I think if it's done right, the organization can serve the revelation of identity, but if it ever switches places, it has ran its course and it's no longer helpful. In fact, at that point, it becomes an obstacle because what we're after is a living from a revelation of our identity in Christ. Spiritual warfare, therefore, may be necessary whenever the enemy is resisting or hindering the tangible expression of the kingdom of God. In other words, our ministry in, pra- in our ministry and prayer, we are called to push back the darkness anywhere that human flush- flourishing or shalom is being dishonored or denied. Our job, our ministry and our prayer, part of it is to push back the darkness anywhere that human flourishing or shalom is being dishonored or denied. It's why we pray with authority, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, deliver us from evil. Now again, that's all I can take you because that's where the scripture takes us. And I think that when the scripture is silent, that our teachers should start to become silent as well. Because I know there's a whole host of like complicated ideas about the hierarchy of demonic beings. And I even worked with a guy at one time that kept a notebook of the different names he discovered of demons and so forth. Look, look, and I'm not saying he's not supposed to do that. I'm not his Lord, I'm not his judge. What I am saying that if he is called to do that, that's something unique and it's not something modeled by the scripture. That is not what we see as a preoccupation with the church's ministry in the scripture. I'm not saying exorcisms don't happen, but they're more spontaneous, and over half of them are not dependent on someone knowing the name of the demon. They're just like, what are you doing? Get out of here. Boom, demon's gone. So, so that's what I'm saying is that I can't give you a sophisticated mythology of demonology this morning because I don't think that that exists in the scripture in the way we like to pretend like it does. But what I am saying is we can say this. There is resistance out there. Sometimes it comes from my own mind, and sometimes it comes from people who are in bondage to toxic, toxic belief systems. But sometimes it's an atmosphere and a culture that is rooted in some sort of demonic influence. And so, and so we are mindful of those things and that our place in this battle that really sometimes looks like a war. When we intercede as spiritual warriors, we're seeking to the implementation of God's kingdom or God's government or God's rule literally on earth as it is in heaven. So, so, so I'm not talking about Christians getting angry with ideology and committing and getting involved in culture wars. Nope, that's not what I'm talking about. Because actually in culture wars, we're fighting the people we're actually called to love and rescue. That's the problem with the culture wars. Even though we'll say, well, we struggle not with flesh and blood. Yeah, but you hate the gays and you hate people who are pro-choice. So you kind of are targeting flesh and blood as your enemy. You got to be delivered from that stuff. You got to be free from that. We can't engage in wars where we're demonizing or making enemies out of the people we're called to love and rescue. I'm talking about something that goes up higher than that. I'm not talking about a culture war. So what I'm saying is this could be the realm of minds, It could be the realm of homes. It could be vocations. It could be communities. It could be nations. There may be time when you just need to get a good parenting book and really bring discipline to your house. And maybe your child is unruly and your child needs to learn rebellion and so forth. I mean, needs to learn to conquer their rebellion. I I totally believe that there are moments of that. But for the Christian, there's this gift in, in, in the book of Corinthians called discernment. And there might be time to say, honey, I don't think any of these things are going to work. I think that what we need to do is get on our knees and join hands, and we need to pray for the soul of our daughter. That's what needs to happen here. Now, again, that doesn't mean that I don't also call a counselor and say, will you see my child for the next so many months? It doesn't mean that we don't go to the doctor to see if there's some sort of thing off base. I believe... But it just means that I also recognize that maybe my responsibility is to pray my heart out for the Lord and stand in the gap because there's a spiritual battle that's going on and Jesus is walking them through it for a reason, but it's a real battle. 
that, that's, all, that's all I'm suggesting is that it's got to be part of our understanding of how we respond to this resistance. Again, it could be our mind, our home, our vocations. I mean, look, I wasn't going to say this. I'm just going to say it. I don't like to use this language because I think it gets abused so much. I don't think in the 25 years that I've been here, partly as youth pastor and then seven or eight as senior pastor, that I ever use this language in a prayer request. But this morning, what I said to the elders is, I need you to pray for me. I don't know, I don't have discernment, this isn't the final answer, but what I'm feeling feels more than just my depression, my insecurities. What I'm feeling, if I can use this language, is it almost feels like demonic resistance. No, I'll go more specific. It feels like demonic oppression. That, that's what it feels like. Now, it might not be, but I am asking you guys to pray for me this week because I feel the presence of that heaviness in regards to a particular, some particular things that I'm trying to sort through. And again, I, 25 years. So it's not like I throw this around. It's just that I recognize that could be part of it. I know it's not the only thing. It doesn't mean that I can't, that, I, that I'm free of having to discipline my flesh, discipline my thought life, learn how to pursue a rhythm that yields itself to a, 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 a better mental health status. I, I get all of that, but right now, it feels like I need something more, and this is how I need you guys to be praying for me right now in this season. And so, and so that's all I'm saying is that we will recognize that that could happen in any area. It could be our own mind, our home, our jobs, communities, our nations. But at the end of the day, my confidence in that prayer request is that God has placed all things in subjection to Christ, that I am part of Christ's body on earth, and we have already won. We are the means through which God's kingdom becomes tangible in our worlds. In fact, I think it's accurate to say that a disciple at some level ought to think about their identity as a viceroy. If you go to dictionary.com, you see a viceroy is a person appointed to rule a country or province as the deputy of the sovereign. It's the calling of original humanity. Whenever God creates Adam and Eve and says, go forth, multiply, and subdue, and take care of this earth, he doesn't mean conquer it. He means tend to it, steward it. We, you are my viceroy on earth. And so at some extent, we are called to live as viceroys of the sovereign King Jesus. My question is, are you living as a viceroy of Christ in every sphere of responsibility that you have been given? So discernment, prayer, spiritual warfare as a viceroy of Christ means something different to Jen and I in regards to Ari, Abby, and Anna than it does to you. We have been given a particular stewardship of those souls. So we have a responsibility to steward that in a way that represents Jesus, in a way that you all don't have. But we all have those spheres of responsibility, and the way we infuse Christ, who fills all in all, is to actually live our lives as viceroys of the sovereign. You know, as we get ready to close, basically the resistance comes from three broad ideas or influences in the scripture. If you read Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 3, it says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. Everyone say world. Thank you. Um, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. This has to do with the influence of Satan and demonic evil. And verse 3 all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So what that tells me is that the truth of the matter is there's this influence called the world, which is a ideological system that is opposed to submitting to the kingdom of God. Um, then there is the reality of this of this spiritual resistance, 
which is called the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's at work in the sons of disobedience, the ver- various language of it, but it's pointing to uh, a, an evil that is rooted in, in uh, uh, that, that is spiritual in nature. And then finally it says, we also have to contend with the lustful gratifications and desires and the pride of the flesh. So throughout history, all Christian denominations have recognized, yeah, the resistance to the Christian comes from the world, the flesh, or the devil. And, and again, that doesn't speak to things like the healing of trauma and chemi- chemical imbalances. I, I'm not denying those. It's just what I'm addressing here is, is this cosmology of the Bible that says we have to be discerning when it comes to the influences of the world, the flesh, and the devil. So, as we get ready to close and the worship team comes forward, Here's my simple question that I want you to bring before the Lord as you approach the communion table. Is there any area of responsibility in which you may need to be more proactive in resisting the influence of the world, the flesh, and the devil? Take a few minutes, close your eyes, and ask that of the Spirit. For me, the answer was yes, and the area was not ambiguous. I intend to live differently this week. I intend to do things differently this week because of the revelation that just happened in my heart, or it's been happening, to be honest. Now, would you all stand with me, and in your notes, you have a prayer. If the Spirit leads you, I would suggest that you utilize this prayer, experiment with it. Say you and either by yourself or if you're married, you and your partner perhaps, your spouse, uh, you're going to take a moment at the beginning or the end of each day to pray this prayer. Just for a week, two weeks, whatever you set, but do it for whatever time frame you set it for. So however you want to do this, you can close your eyes as I pray it. You can read along with me and pray it as your own prayer in your heart, uh, however you feel most comfortable. But just before we take communion, I want us to take a moment to pray this prayer together. And if the Lord leads, maybe this is something that you'll work into your own rhythm as well. Heavenly Father, we are just seeking to respond to the revelation of the Scripture and to pray well and to pray from that spirit of the Lord's prayer in which you call us to pray, Come, kingdom of God. Be done, will of God. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. And so we pray. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, I stand against the world, the flesh, and the devil. I resist every force that would seek to distract me from my center in God, in Christ. I reject the distorted concept and ideas that make sin plausible and desirable. I oppose every attempt to keep me from knowing full fellowship with By the power of the Holy Spirit, I speak directly to the thoughts, emotions, and desires of my heart, and I command you to find your satisfaction in the infinite variety of God's love rather than the bland diet of sin. I call upon the good, the true, and the beautiful to rise up within me and the evil to subside. I ask for an increase in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. By the authority of Almighty God, I tear down Satan's strongholds in my life, in the lives of those I love, and in the society in which I live. I take into myself the weapons of truth, righteousness, peace, salvation, the word of God and prayer. I command every evil influence to leave. You have no right here, and I allow you no point of entry. I ask for an increase of faith, hope, and love, so that by the power of God, I might, that I can be a light set on a hill causing truth and justice to flourish. These things I pray for the sake of him who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen.